Yes, uh, where we we're here to lean a little bit into your weird to do the thing, even if you suck at it, and to fully show up for this one wild and precious life. Like I said earlier, I'm bringing on Dr. Sarah Bolin. Um, about two weeks ago, she got in touch with me and was like, hey, um, let's get real on, um, on a platform uh, where we could do a lot of good. So here she is. Um, where are you? Da there she is. Sweet grass coming in. So yeah, um, tonight we're gonna talk about wellness um, and emotional wellness as well as physical wellness. Hey, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, um, are we on? I'm here, we almost going live with Sweetgrass on the socials, all the yeah. places. <laughs> thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, hello, <laughs> Dr. Sarah. Um, <laughs> you you look a little bit um, blurry on the. Oh, yeah, let's let's clean that guy up. <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> That's in the mud, I guess. Cool. Uh, well, for everyone, tell us um, all of your titles. Like you know, we've got the doctor part, but you're also an athlete. Um, so can you share a little bit about some of your, you know, proudest moments are, uh, as an athlete and, you know, accomplishments says just who are you? Yeah. So uh, I'm a doctor of clinical psychology. I got my doctorate in 2011 and um, I came on, I lived in Montana for a while before and um, fell in love with Glacier National Park and, um, returned as soon as I could, and I opened up Sweetgrass Psychological Services. Our mission at Sweetgrass is to make Montana mentally well, which given that Montana has the highest rate of suicide in the country was no small task, but we are on it. And um, yeah, in my free time, I ski and I climb mountains and um, mountain bike and run. And so I'm kind of in both worlds. I'm in the mountain world and I'm in the like geeky psychology world where I re read a lot of books and learn a lot of things. And I'm excited to be able to bridge that gap. Yeah. So what's your story? Um, I've heard you say before that uh, a lot of talent doesn't necessarily make it out of the cities uh, to come help uh, our less, you know, smaller communities out here. So you know, what made you passionate about serving mountain towns? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think as somebody who lived in a mountain town for many years before going to grad school, I sort of saw the suffering. I felt it in myself. I saw that alcohol abuse, the drug abuse, um, depression. Where was that again? Is that's that here in Whitefish, yeah. Okay. Whitefish, Montana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was offered a position in Austin, Texas. I was offered a position in Denver, Colorado, and I realized that they have lots of great talent there and places like this really need more help. And, um, you know, it's also easy because I was like, well, if I live in Montana, I can climb the Montana mountains, right? And you can't do that as easily in Austin, Texas. But um, it was really, it felt really important to me to be able to serve the people who were just like me, you know, who were passionate, who were engaged, who wanted to be outdoors, and yet who were suffering. Right? Yeah, you said you lost your dad early on too. Um, did that push you to go in any direction? Yeah, so my dad died when I was eight, and I think my mom, you know, found a therapist, and the therapist tried to help me, and... Um, you know, I'm sure she did her best at the time with what she knew and what she had available to her back in the 80s, but um, it wasn't particularly helpful for me. And so I made a commitment kind of then in my small child mind that I was going to someday help people and didn't know what that would look like. And um, pretty early on discovered that when you take people outdoors, they need help less. And I wrote my dissertation on rock climbing and um, started researching like how you could use climbing tools helping 
um, women in particular. And um, yeah, and then like one thing leads to another and here I am, right? Well, you brought up suicide. So um, why do you think that we have the largest amount of suicides in mountain towns? Like we've heard, yeah, give us all the, all the reasons. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot. I think one is that there's not as many resources in mountain towns. And um, we know that a lot of people who suicide haven't gotten the help that they need. There was a statistic I read some years ago that shocked me that was that the average length of time between the onset of difficulties, so the first time somebody notices anxiety or depression, to the time that they actually sit in the office with a therapist or a provider is 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's a really long time. And what happens in that time is that people decline, right? Like the anxiety gets worse, the depression, you know, gets bigger and problems mount. And then it's, you're digging yourself out of a way deeper hole. And it's practice thinking. You don't realize you're practicing a certain way that isn't serving you. And right. you're conditioning it. If it's, yeah, it's something telling you it's not wrong and you're still like, I mean, let's talk about it. Like why, wh what are, what is the stigma of, of yeah. not talking about it? Yeah, it's a great question because I think right now the stigma's kind of been blown up a little bit because everybody is suddenly talking about mental health. Like yes. mental health is really having a moment right now and it's great. Um, and I think it's out of just necessity. You know, people are really struggling. So they're really needing to, you know, dive into this. But the Which stigma is exciting, you know, yeah. like you don't have the distractions anymore to, to get along, you know, to get I, by. And even yeah. though it sucks not to have those distractions. It's also a beautiful thing to make us focus and discipline our minds. Like I'm, exactly. it's not easy, but I'm grateful. You know, we yeah. are we're having to shift. We've known that we've needed to shift and we are, we're all shifting in different ways and it's not easy. I'm not, you know, suggesting that it is. And at the same time, like, I don't know, here we are. <laughs> yeah, here we are. You know, I think about um, maybe like 10 years ago, my I took my mom on like a whitewater rafting trip here and uh, she lives in New York City. So like anything we do here is just delightful to her. And uh, we were like, at some point leading up to the trip, I was like, oh, it's gonna be that awkward moment where somebody asks me what I do and then I can either like be honest or I can stop the conversation, you know? And sure enough, everybody's going around the boat like, oh, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I'm a psychologist. And it was like crickets, you know? And in the- Because everyone years, feels like they're, they're, you're looking through them. <laughs> right, and I'm like, no, 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 not working. I'm and then by the end of the trip, they're like, so could I talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> My uncle has really been struggling. Um, and <laughs> yeah. And I think nowadays, like, it's just gotten better. Like, even in those 10 years, suddenly people are able and willing to talk. And like you said, like, this is a tough time for people. And, you know, people have lost access to a lot of their primary coping strategies, and people are feeling isolated. And on top of it, we're like dealing with a global pandemic, which threatens our like sort of existential existence, right? Which those were a lot of big words all to say, like, we're just scared, right? We're scared of dying. We're scared of people we love dying. And so um, so like, at a root level is, is like, it's, it's your foundation. It's your, it's your security. It's uh, so like when this, yeah, this constant level of, of stress is at, bubbling at the root of everything, of course, all the other things are going to be limited. And then being that it's been what, two months now? Um, of that yeah, or two time. years. It's hard to tell. I feel like I've lost. Oh, you. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, like that feeling, like I related a lot to like being in avalanche terrain and being in that place where you've said you wanted to be and everything feels pretty uncertain, you know, and you've done research and you've done your homework and you've, done your observations, and yet you still don't know what's going on beneath the surface. And we do that, right? And we're there for a few hours or maybe a full day. We've been here for two months, you know, in that state of uncertainty. And that really wears on your system. And, you know, there's that feeling of like clinking beers at the car after getting back safely, you know, six hours later, that's so relieving. Um, and and here we are like- rest. Yeah, right, exactly. And right. like maybe doing it again tomorrow, maybe not doing it again for a week, depending on how stressful it was. 
Um, but here we're just kind of in it, you know, over and over every day. So yeah, it's definitely wearing on all of us. So that's why that's what you're saying is why you might not be feeling your ultimate best right now or showing up to work like you would like to, or for your, all the, all the reasons, like it's okay to feel really heavy and not perfect these days. And that's why. Yeah, totally. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's just hard. Like things are hard. And I, I feel like I had a friend who asked me if she, we could go for like a morning run the other day, which is something I do a lot normally. And I was like, I don't think I can get out of the house by seven. And I am like a early riser. I have no trouble getting out of the house, um, but I haven't been leaving the house a whole lot. So I'm kind of out of practice. Plus everything feels a little harder. And so it's like, you know, and I talk a lot about giving yourself grace and being patient and being gentle. How I've been thinking of it is like, imagine that you are wading through molasses, right? Like that is what this is. And um, depending so if you're on- you're not running your fastest mile right now, or like, <laughs> right. oh, you didn't start those three new businesses you were going to at the beginning of this thing. <laughs> right, you haven't worked on your sourdough loaf, like, right. you're fine. like you're fine, yeah. You're normal, turns out. And that's why it's like mm-hmm. something legitimate is going on in, in your system that's, taking care of the existential crisis. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And it's doing hero's work. Cool, thank you for yeah. saying that. So yeah. let's talk about coping mechanisms. You know, um, there's the ones that country music sings about, you know, and then there's the ones that us outdoor athletes know are a drug of like, I love to go for a run and clear my head. And I know that physiologically I'm changing as well, you know, my, my chemicals. Um, but I've also been hurt before and had to find other coping mechanisms. So can you talk about that for a general, you know, all of us mountain athletes and then, and then, you know, taking all that away? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, um, I'm injured currently. I have this like hip injury and, uh, you know, and then of course, like you can't go to PT like normal. You can't go to the doctor like normal. And so I've not been running and um, it's brutal. Like, I notice it. Like I feel it laying in bed at night. Like my body has more energy than has been expended, you know, and I'm ready for more and (laughs) trying to sleep. sleep. I find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think for many of us, um, being in the mountains fills us up completely and totally. It exhausts us. It, you know, kind of sets everything right again. But what happens when you can't be in the mountains as so many of us have been feeling lately. And, um, you know, so for me, it's funny, I, I was uh, talking to some friends the other day about how important it is to have like a list of coping strategies that uh, you can refer to. And then I was like, I don't even have that list myself, like I maybe should spend a little time. And so I did, I like sat down and I asked myself this question, like, what makes you feel good um, on a regular basis? And then what makes you feel better when things are not so great? Um, so Lindsay, like for you, like, what are some things that you do that kind of help you maintain that level of mental fitness? And I know we're going to talk more about what mental fitness is later, but, um, like, what are the things that you do besides running besides, you know, being in the mountains that help you feel well? Or help me feel like my best version of myself. Or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I really want to know what mental fitness is. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so I could tell you what makes me feel better. Well, um, I still want to know, you know, is it the equivalent? It is the equivalent of lifting weights on in the physical body for um, some of the work I've been doing. So anyways, uh, what I do, <sighs> well, it depends on when I'm hurt and when I'm not hurt. <laughs> right. So let's Absolutely. go with hurt because I think yeah. that's more. I think that's what we're right here now. to talk about. Yeah. yeah. So the reason why I'm so grateful for actually being hurt in the past as an athlete is because it taught me how to strive to find these other coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and sadly, like I pushed as hard as I could, you know, for as long as I could, but it's, you're not going to want to hear this and it's meditation, <laughs> right? It is uh, it's like, meditation. Oh, never, oh, I'm so bad at meditation. I've tried it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're all bad at it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, man, the first time I ever got hurt was one of the hardest times of my life because I, 
I, I, oh gosh, because I, I, I actually couldn't even handle it, which is why I think I got hurt a year later because I didn't actually mm -hmm. deal with whatever, with the lesson. And that's the greatest part of what injuries have taught me and the great lessons, even though they're so painful so, mentally. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing I, um, when I finally, first of all, I guess surrender um, mm -hmm. is the first thing injury taught me. Like, I, I guess I'm not all in control like I thought I was. And to finally just let go of, of all the things that were taken away, you know, your season plans, all, you know, the, your dreams, whatever. Um, that's, that's the first one. And then, and then the, I guess like, I would rather be in the mountains all day long than anything. If I could, like once I, you know, really make it, that's what I'll go do. <laughs> um, and, uh, but this is, I'm really passionate about this too. So I, I can't lie about that. So, so being in the mountains and breathing, mm -hmm. um, and then, if I can't be in the mountains, then breathing. So I, um, I, I'm trained in a, a technique called transformational breathing, and you don't necessarily need fancy breathwork training, but I'd say breathwork helps me get into my body and then into a meditative state. If I really, if that's my only option for, um, um, I guess I don't even know what to call it. Um, so you're welcome to pick me apart, and uh, <laughs> anything we can do to be of greatest service to this audience, like. Um, that's what I'm here for. And I know that's why you're here. So, yeah. So that's great. So, um, meditation, like there, if we could like hear everybody listening, there'd be like a collective groan, right? Cause it's like, oh, it's always meditation. That's always the answer. Right. And that but didn't I, work for me. I tried it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and I want to say like why meditation, right? So meditation, I think of as like knowing your path home to that space in yourself where everything is okay. And, um, that place can feel really far when we're in a crisis or we're in a difficult spot or we're in a global pandemic or we're deep in the backcountry and we're kind of freaking out, right? That place inside of ourselves is just us and the breath and it's quiet and it's soothing and it's thoughtful and reflective. Meditation is not about just sitting in that space and being like, oh, this is amazing, right? It's practicing over and over again the route back to that place so that you can always find your way there. I've and heard it called like the act of not thinking, the place of not thinking where you're you're free in a space where you're not thinking. Yeah. And if you get even a few moments of it, you're winning. Right. Um, and that's what athletics does too. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. another way there. Totally. And I think like for me, running is like this great mindfulness activity, or it also sometimes feels mindlessness, which is also important. Um, yeah, but what do we do if we can't get there? So we've mentioned a few, so we're gonna try to get five. So we've got breath and we've got time in the mountains. I'll give you that. What are three other things that help you feel good? And it could be like calling a friend, it could be, um, and I can tell you like what's on my list, right? So- Yeah, let's hear it. Like uh, snuggles with my dog is really high yeah. up on my list. There's like nothing that can reset me quite like that. Um, baking is high on my list as well. I have like a little tribe of women with whom I bake pretty regularly. And so it's not just the baking, but also the camaraderie and yeah. kind of time with companions. I really love bubble baths. Um, I don't take them as often as maybe I could, but I really enjoy them. And I also really love reading a good book that like takes me to a different space, right? So not just a book that you're like, oh, whatever, but the kind where you're like thinking about the characters and you're wondering what's you're going on. You're in the world. Yeah, you're in their world. Um, because sometimes I don't want to be in my world. I'd rather be in somebody else's world. So which that's kind puts of on some other ones, which is like television is, yeah. is an outlet. Um, uh, I just thought of another, I, I mean, I guess that's the social media is too, right? Like you're checking yeah. out and scrolling through other, you know, potential worlds. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, like as long as your list is kind of balanced, right? If your five things are like Netflix, Hulu, Disney plus, right? Like if that's your whole list, like, eh, maybe we have a problem, but it could definitely be on there. Yeah. I think the other thing that injury taught me is that as a professional athlete is that I needed to find a hobby because if I couldn't ski, I sure needed to find other sources of, I guess, being, you know, if you're not an athlete, what are you? And also, you know, backup income, if you're not going to like, you're taking ma massive risks. So th I think that's also where I developed art and I don't know developed. I think I came out um, right. as an artist uh, and uh 
but to to really consciously put time toward that so-called hobby like with showing up it's kind of like you know do the thing even if you suck at it right because it's going to take a long time before you're good at it what, what is it playing the guitar is it like learning how to paint because you're going to be really bad for mm -hmm. a while <laughs> and you got to let that be okay yeah and not being so attached to the outcome like with meditation or art or whatever right it's not about the goal whereas as mountain athletes, it really often is about the goal. You're like, I need to run 50 kilometers or I need to climb these summits. But can we kind of remove some of that, come back to that place of like, it's not my universe to control, right? And then just like do what we do. I was saying to my partner recently, I was like, I think we need to learn how to cross stitch or like something that like we can do from the couch, like just in case, you know. Um, and for us, we just started doing puzzles. Like we're really taken on the puzzle world right now yeah well we've been um sort of building like home skills too you know like yeah. uh getting lessons on how to shoot a gun and um and it, just because like these are empowering you know life skills like playing with axes you know learning how to cut our i mean not learning but cutting on firewood i don't know just becoming yeah. more self-sufficient and there's something elemental about that you know, I think a lot of people are growing a garden right now and feeling like you have some control over this this thing that you can create. And uh, it's I think that's another really fun way to be present. Mm -hmm. That's great. Like you got ten things on the list, right? I think we all need to have like at least five, not ten, and we need to be in that place where we are able to say well. So I think if I asked you or any listening. What do you say physically fit, right? You'd be like, well, I go for runs, I eat right, I, you know, stretch, I weight lift, right? Like you'd probably be able to rattle them off pretty quickly. And my hope is that everyone I know can get to that place with mental fitness too. So maybe we should talk about like what mental fitness is. Perfect. That'd be great. So um, so if physical fitness is having your body be um able to do what you want and need it to do with, you know, some effort, but not like where it's unable to thrive. Um, mental fitness is really similar. It is having your um, mind be kind of ready for whatever you want um, it to take on or need it to take on, right? So I, I think, <laughs> you know, one of the ways that I think of it is like, um, from this perspective of like a window of tolerance. So here's our window and, you know, things are good, things are bad, right? But we're always within that window. And every now and again, something happens and we're like flown out of the window, either way down or way up. And that's like the place where it's not cool. Like things are not good, right? You're either like totally anxious and totally overwhelmed or you're horribly depressed and like you can't get out of bed. So we want to try to have our mind be able to hold like as much as it needs to. To be fair, a global pandemic is in very few people's window of tolerance. And so most people are either freaking out or horribly like overwhelmed. And that's totally understandable. But we can grow that window. And I think all the sourdough baking and all the puzzle doing and, you know, chopping firewood, all of that is an effort to like make the window a little bigger. So I picture the window here and every coping skill is stacked up and that's how high your window is. So if skiing is your only coping skill, like your window is only this big and that's fine as long as your whole life is right there. But as soon as your life gets richer and fuller and more exciting and more adventurous, like what then, right? So you got to build on that stuff. I love and that you just said richer and fuller and more adventurous. It's also a mindset, right? Like we see the outdoors as, you know, oh, there's another false summit. Summit. We're continuing on the adventure. Uh, and our life just got fuller with more summits. <laughs> you know, that's just, I think that's a fun way to, uh, I don't know, take some of the heaviness and scariness out of uh, what we're experiencing because, uh, we can do this. We were built for hard things. We know because we've we've climbed high mountains and we've suffered and gotten to the top or made it through friendships or all the things. Uh, it looks a little different, but I, I know that as mountain people, we've been here before. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess the other thing is we didn't quite also finish like the top reasons why 
you know, why mountain towns are more most susceptible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for bringing me back to that. So, um, so we talked already about like the lack of resources. There is a lot of evidence to show that stigma is more powerful in a mountain town. Um, you know, I would say like fashion trends are always a little behind in Montana. And I think the same is true for like, you know, like Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like it's like, okay, we're just catching up. So in New York, maybe everybody's talking about their therapist and how cool they are. Like it's going to be a minute here before we get to that. So, and, um, why is that? Like why, why are things progressing? Supposedly is that progression in the cities? Like why do we uh, see it that way? You know, my opinion on that is that, um, Smaller towns are a little more resistant to change, right? We're a little bit slower to like catch on. We like things done the way they've always been done. Um, but there's something interesting about that also. And I would say, and I don't want to speak for my whole town on this, but I would say that since Sweetgrass has opened here, we've already seen a change in whitefish. I have way more friends who go to therapy just because they know me. We've made it more accessible, more available, more affordable. Um, so the opposite is also true. Like in a small town, you can actually make bigger changes, right? Like in a big city to change millions of people's minds takes a lot of effort. In a small town where you can like, by word of mouth, reach everybody, like you can actually you know, maybe make some things happen. Well, and then having access to the mountains as well, like. Right, exactly. Like yeah. Once, once we figure this out as mountain people of like how we actually train our minds, we're going to crush it. <laughs> but no one's taught us yet. Right, exactly. Because we crush it everywhere else. Yeah. Right? We crush it physically. We crush mm -hmm. it like when we're going uphill. Well, that's all we're doing. It's exactly the same. We enjoy suffering. Yeah. And once we can embrace it on all the levels, we're going to the moon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, for everyone to think about, like, what is it that gets me through in those really hard moments? So kind of going back to that idea of like, okay, we talked about what keeps you mentally fit, but what do you do when things are really, really hard? And, um, you know, that could be as simple as like, I count to 27. So I'll share my mom again. We hiked, we did this um, through hike in Ireland for um, 10 days, uh, maybe about 10 years ago. And she, it was hard for her physically. And um, one of the things she did when she would be having a hard time is she would just count her steps and she would get to 100 and she would start over. And since she shared that with me, I have definitely employed that several times. You know, like you have a 14 mile approach, like that's a lot of like, that's too much to carry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you're just like 100 at a time. Right. And you get to 100 and you start over and we can do that when we're stressed also. Right. So we're having a fight with our spouse or we're really frustrated about something at work, like count to 100. Right. Try it out. Um, and some of the other things I think that we um you know, use as mountain athletes, like we keep our eye on the prize. We think about like our goal. We think about our mission, right? We remain connected to like, what is it that I love about being out here? Like, why am I doing this suffering uh, when I don't really have to, right? And the same can be true when you're thinking about your life. Like, why am I in this friendship when it causes me stress? Why am I, you know, having to think about these things? So, um, finding those parallels and knowing that you already have that mental fitness, you have that fortitude, you have that endurance. Um, how do you apply that to your daily life and your difficult? Okay. So you're saying like at, at a time when you're, you're not struggling too much, write down your five things that you really go to when, when you are struggling, write them down. And then, and then would you say like, practice them when you're not in that state? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So the same thing, like when I know ski season is coming up, I start doing squats and lunges. I feel like I never start it early enough, but I'm always like, okay. We all have that same thought. <laughs> yeah. Oh, why do you start this? I wish I would have sent it harder right. in the summer. <laughs> well, I've done a hundred lunges. I should be good, right? Um, <laughs> I'll ski myself into shape. No, right. Said by no one ever. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the same is true. Like I know that I have a big thing at work coming up or I know that I have to go to this family thing that's causing me stress. Like let's get down to business. Like let's start doing squats and lunges, right? And what are those things that you do? So if it's meditation or it's breathing or it's counting or it's, 
you know, paint by numbers, like whatever it is, like rehearse that, practice that, integrate that into your life. Um, so that when you really need it, it's kind of like a given, you, you know exactly what to do, right? Um, yeah, like you said, even before we said, oh, I do a breathing, I hope it's like a little breathing before this. I also like to take five minutes before I see any plant or before I do anything useful. Um, so you reverse that and you do it all the time. And when you really need it, your body's like, I know what to do. I got this, right? I'm going to do the thing. So, yeah, I think it's like, it's all about practice. And I encourage people to like write those five things down, put them in your wallet, put it, at, you know, as a note on your phone so that you always have it available so that you always remember it. So what would you say to, you know, people that are starting to get really nervous about income? You know, it's like, okay, all that sounds nice, but how am I going to pay my bills this month? You know right. what? Whoa, I just dropped. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, what are what are some of the things that your biggest clients are struggling with? And um, and yeah, finances being one. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So um, I would say this. Often we have like the problem and then we have all the stories that we've written about the problem. And the problem is usually the thing we can address and the thing we can do something about the stories that we write are much harder to address because they just live in our head kind of over and over and over again. So if you have this anxiety about paying your bills, say, or about going back to work, I think a lot of people are feeling like, okay, our states are opening back up and now I'm expected to go back to work and I'm actually feeling pretty nervous about that. Um, kind of breaking that down. So like, what's the thing, right? Well, the thing is that I have like my bank account is way smaller than it's ever been. And I feel really nervous that it's never going to, you know, be enough. Right. That's a valid fear. Okay. And then ask yourself, I kind of have this like little, um, what do they call it? Like a step-by-step -step, like um, flow chart. So you have the problem. Is there something you can do about it? Well, I could hustle, right? I, there are some things that I could do. I could start selling some things or I could start creating again that thing that brings in some money. Cool. So if there's something you can do about it, it's not really worth your time to worry about it. You should just go do the thing that can change it. I love that. Don't waste time worrying, like move, do the thing. Right, exactly. But then on the other hand, if there's nothing you can do about it. So if you're like, I've exhausted all possibilities, they're really, I'm really just stuck here. Okay, then there's nothing you can do about it. So there's no sense in worrying, right? So the end of the flow chart always comes back to like, don't worry, right? Either do how you get there or sit with it, right? And I think that that can feel really empowering to people like, oh, there's actually something I can do. If there's nothing you can do, it's hard. And it comes back to that place of like, it's not my universe to control. And that's like anybody who's been injured, anybody who's been like rained out from a summit bid, right? Like we know that feeling of frustration of like, but I really wanted this. I, I really needed this and yet I can't have it. Um, and so then enter grief, right? Mm. And I think this whole last two months has been for many people kind of a crash course in grieving and understanding how to sit with that difficult feeling of like, I didn't get the thing I wanted and I may never get it and I lost something or, you know, I'm, I'm really feeling some pain here. And grief can be about loss of life, but grief can be about kind of everything. And yeah. um, one of the things I think a lot about is grief of our anticipated reality. So we imagined things were supposed to go a certain way. Uh, I'm pretty sure this weekend I was supposed to be in California visiting with my mom, right? Everybody's got a story like that. Right. Mm -hmm. and that's our anticipated reality. We wrote a mm -hmm. whole story about what 2020 was going to look like. And we were told to, you know, like yeah. you're supposed to do that sort of thing. That's what motivates you. And yeah. yeah. And then what do you do when you get smacked down, you know? And I think for mountain athletes, we also know that we know that feeling like I'm sure you've been shut down from things, right? The conditions weren't right. Like it just wasn't your day. Like, oh, yeah, it's part of it. Yeah, it's a huge part of it. It's not the part that we like post pictures about and we write about, right? I think and, it might be why I stopped, you know, being attached to those sorts of things, you know, because, so? 
I could care less about summits. I could care less about winning. Um, Cause I also saw maybe some of the false, like it, the thing that I thought I would feel, it wasn't there. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I came this way. I wanted this. Well, so many things, right? Like that a cool award. Like that, you know, that milestone. Like, oh, I'm still that person. So looks like I have some other directions to go to look for what I am really after. That's yeah. for yeah. yeah. And that's a great point, Lindsay, because I think that in those times of grief, meaning and purpose really come into focus. And we start asking ourselves those like existential questions of like, who am I? Like, what am I, what is my function? You know, I have a lot of friends who have been out of work and suddenly they don't, they no longer feel like contributing members of society. And so who are they, especially if they identified themselves with that role, you know, you identified yourself as a skier, like that's who you were. And, um, part of the grieving process is coming to a place of making meaning and understanding like, um, you know, what is this really about for me? And, you know, we were talking about like, I think in some ways there's this good thing that's coming out of this like terrible period in our lives where suddenly we're all talking more about mental health. We're all getting more real, more vulnerable. And, you know, I, I think that's a wonderful thing. And so if that's your new mission, you know, then like, that's a great mission. Yeah. Speaking about being vulnerable. Um, I love that we have a similar phrase, you know, the, when I started this podcast, I was like, what is this really about? And, and I'm like, embrace your weird. <laughs> and you have, and, and I know what that means to me, but I, you have so eloquently spoken about um, embracing the awkward. And I love that. And uh, they're very similar. So would you share about what Yeah. Um, so I'm a little awkward just by nature. We so, all are right? yeah. in reality. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. And, um, and so for me, embracing the awkward is like, approaching that person anyway, saying the thing anyway, being less concerned with how it comes out and more concerned with that it comes out. And um, and how it lands and how they feel about it. And did they think I was weird? And Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, I mean, every parent has said this to every high school or ever, but like the reality is like, they're way less concerned with you they're more concerned with themselves, right? Everybody is self-conscious and we can't be wondering about other people nearly as much as we like to think. And so um, I think one of the things I hear a lot from folks is, well, I didn't know how to ask. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to ask if they were all right or if they were really doing okay. And, um, you know, I'm sort of cheering for the side of like, ask anyway, you know, if it comes out awkward, like, great, cool, you know, and you can even own that you can be like, this is going to sound really awkward, but I just wanted to ask you this thing. And chances are, um, you know, in my experience that the person is going to remember that you checked in on them way more than they're going to remember how weird you sounded. And, um, and I know that's true for me. Like when I think of my friends who have really reached out, like I don't remember that they said that really weird thing. I remember that they like wrapped their, you know, heart around me and made me feel supported and connected and loved. So you're just talking about it in, in terms of reaching out to someone you might be worried about. Is that, that's what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm saying too, and all the other ways, you know, to get a chance to share yourself with someone, even if it doesn't land right, like to have that courage uh, is I think an act of self-love. I totally agree with you. I totally agree. And I think it's like, um, so again, I'm gonna bring it back to the mountains, but when we're in the back country and we're skiing, we're needing to make a decision about avalanche terrain, love this, yeah. right? We're like, all right, let's just lay it all out there on the table because like this really matters, right? And I want to hear from you and I want to hear from you. And what do you think about this, right? And um, and I think even in that world, people can be nervous like, oh, what if I don't say it right? Or what if I don't know how to refer to the pit test? And, or like, what if I'm like, say the other thing other than the guy who's the most, who knows <laughs> the most here or who holds the most clout and it, it you know, doesn't fit with the group. You're like this is exactly, you know, mountain terms. Yep, exactly. And so- the same is true just showing up with each other, right? So if I show up with you and I sound kind of goofy or I, you know, 
say a thing and maybe I'm going to go home and think about that thing and obsess over it and be like, oh, I can't believe I said that thing to Lindsay. Like, and everybody was watching like, oh, it's so embarrassing. Right. But that's not what you're going to remember, right? You're going to remember the feeling of connection. You're going to remember the honesty. And the same is true in the mountains. Like, I don't necessarily remember like what the person said, but I remember that they spoke up for themselves and they, you know, shared their vulnerability and their concerns. And I really honor that, right? Because we want to know each other. We want to know what's real for everybody. Um, otherwise, it's just like fluff, right? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about motivation these days? You know, you've talked about like how, how do you find that mission if you if you have found yourself like looking in a new direction um, and and purpose and and motivation. Yeah, I think a lot of people are talking about like, well, I just yeah, like I thought I'd bake the bread and go to like work out all those sweet workouts that people were offering. You know, like and it's just more yeah, reasons to beat yourself up, right? Yeah. Um, so where do you find that purpose, that motivation, um, and use this time to, to the best that we can? Yeah. So I think first off, like lower those expectations, just a couple notches for yourselves, right? Like this is a tough time. The world is suddenly filled with molasses. Like, yeah, like you said, you're not running your fastest mile right now. So if you've never made bread before and never had a sourdough starter, like, I don't know that you need to be making like a ambitious goal like that, right? Maybe your goal is to make chocolate chip cookies off the box or maybe to make brownies from a mix, you know? So like figuring out like what's reasonable. Gluten-free, of course, because if you're watching any of my other stuff, Adam would crush us if we had any <laughs> nuts or grains or, or, or starches for 90 days for our right. gut lining. Right, of course. <laughs> So hard. <laughs> that sounds really hard. That sounds like an ambitious. Here's another one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, right. So maybe 30 days, you know, or like nine days for me, that would be like a lot. Right. That would be a lot. Nine so days. the same way with like the mountains. So like, I don't plan a huge trip in November, right. When I'm like kind of out of shape, right. That's going to wait until February or March. So I think knowing what is reasonable for you and then once you achieve a goal, we all know that then it's easier to get to the next goal. So maybe your goal is waking up at 8 a.m. and going for a walk. And like, maybe that feels disappointing to you. Like you're like, oh, all I'm doing is waking up at 8 a.m. Like anyone can do that, right? Well, no, right? Not now and not always. And so setting reasonable expectations, maybe lowering some of those standards, putting yourself in a position where you kind of feel like, yeah, I think this is, you know, just kind of right there. So I think of like, we've got our familiar zone and we've got our panic zone. And in between the two is like where the magic happens, right? So you don't want to spend all your time in your familiar zone, but if you're like uncomfortable, like I was picturing it, like you're learning how to like self-arrest, right? So are you going to take yourself to like the steepest slope and like put yourself on that slope and like see how you do? No, like you're going to take yourself to a test slope where it's maybe feels a little bit safer and you can like, you know, feel a little more comfortable and then you grow your confidence and then you can kind of expand that bubble a little bit. So we don't want to spend all our time in our familiar zone, like Netflix and chill, like great, right? But maybe not 24 seven. But we also don't want to spend all our time in our panic zone where we're like frantically trying to do all of these things that we've never done before and maybe we don't have the skills for, right? So how do you like regulate that? And what does that look like for you? And yeah. also, you know, if you're trying to bring it back to athletics and, and outdoors, what do our goals look like in when you think of mental fitness, right? Like we know, you know, physical strength to get us to the top of something on the physical side. like how are our goals shifting? Like what does wellness look like here? Uh, do, you, do you get what I'm saying? Like, how do we set that up so that when, like you said, you're trying to gauge, uh, when I heard you say lower your expectations, I'm like, oh God, that's like everything I've heard not to do as an athlete, you can always push more, right? And so, so it's like, so how do I reset the goals um, for being like really kind to yourself without like letting yourself be, a lazy pile right like what is the difference 
Right. And maybe on Tuesday you have to be a lazy pile, right? Like maybe that's what has to happen. But I think for many of us, we're so ambitious and we're so motivated most of the time that like we're pretty far from being lazy piles. You know what I mean? Like you Well, have that's just it is like where how do you build in the appropriate like scale? Like right. to know. Totally. And I think times. So I would say, and I imagine, Lindsay, like when you were really training really intensely for something, did you ever get to the point where your body was just like totally exhausted? Yeah, I knew I was overtraining. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I know for me, there's like this sweet spot when I'm like ramping up my mileage for a race or something. And there's that phase where you're like eating everything in sight and you're like hungry, but you you're energy feels replenished and you're yeah. excited for your runs. Sure. Right. And then boom, you hit this wall and you're like, I can't run three miles. Like I am oh. so tired. Right. And the same is true mentally. So for me, like I love to have things on my to-do list and I love to have projects and I love to have plans and I love to make plans. Right. And then some morning I wake up and I'm just like, no, like nothing. I can't do anything today. And ideally over time with physical stuff, I've learned like what that looks like. I've learned that I need to build in some rest weeks. I've learned that I need to like taper sooner. I love the taper. It's like my favorite time. Right. So what does the mental taper look like? What does right. the mental rest week look like? Right. And, um, like right now, for example, I'm seeing all my clients through telehealth and, I realized the other day with the help of my therapist that I could take a vacation. She's like, yeah, just because you're not going out of town doesn't mean you don't need time off. And I was like, oh, that's brilliant. So I scheduled a week off for two weeks from now, right? Because I can feel that I'm starting to drag emotionally, right? I'm not as quick. I don't want to have like all the same conversations that I usually want to have with my friends, right? I just feel fatigued. So I think you can overtrain physically and I think you can overtrain mentally and you can hit that wall and hopefully you hit the wall a few times and then you learn like where the wall is and then you're like, all right, let's back it off a little bit. And it's different for everybody. Everybody has a different level of um, ability there. And uh, it's very different. Like there was like a two week period where I couldn't wear any pants with buttons. Like I was just like in revolt. If they weren't sweatpants or yoga pants, like I wasn't into it, you know? And then I set a goal and I was like, on Monday, I'm going to wear pants with a button. Like that's my goal. You know, it's so silly and it sounds. No, but attainable goals that allow yourself to see, see progress and also give yourself grace. I think that's beautiful. It makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Anything else that you really want to share today? Yeah. Um, so I think I want to go back um, to the, well, I want to go back to everything, but I want to go back to the um, suicide question. Cause I think this is something that people don't often get to talk about and it feels like it touches our communities. Um, Everybody knows someone. Uh, most people have had, what they call like these thoughts that they should feel ashamed of and no one talks about it. Yeah. And it is rampant in our mountain towns. That's it where totally is. Do you want to just call it out? Like Alaska, uh, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, Montana, the highest. Colorado. Colorado. <laughs> Duh. That's like number three. Um, yeah. And, and I've heard it's uh, isolation, drug and alcohol issues um, and, and cost. Like there's sort of this fantasy about moving to the mountains and then uh, the reality of it. Uh, and then there's one more, but it's a, I did a lot of research on it. Um, I've been, I actually spoke to, there's a, also a nonprofit called the Check-In Foundation. Yeah. They're doing great work uh, with mountain biking. Are you aware of them? Yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. So we've got some um, interviews coming from them too, but we've all know someone, spring is the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, please take it away. Yeah. So, I mean, here's the thing, like we don't know, right? We never know why somebody chooses to suicide. Um, but we do know, right, you named kind of all those risk factors and isolation and loneliness are such a huge part of it. And um, shame. So isolation, we, loneliness and shame. Yeah. So we have like the struggle, whatever the struggle is, it's financial, it's relationship, it's um, not feeling good enough. And then we wrap that struggle up in a ball of shame and we tuck it away because shame tells us you can't let anybody see this. And um, 
it's tragic, right? Because then we suffer alone with that. So whether it's an insecurity or, uh, you know, a trauma that you've endured and some of those traumas happen in the mountains, right? Cause the other thing that's true in mountain towns mm-hmm. is that we all know somebody who has died in a mountain mm-hmm. accident. And, um, so we kind of bundle up that, you know, pain and then we tuck it away in our little closet of shame. And the mm-hmm. thing that is so, um, inspiring to me about this time is that like this time in our lives is that I'm starting to see people have more authentic conversations around the pain. And I'm starting to see the shame kind of lift because suddenly, because we're all struggling, it's suddenly kind of okay to struggle. Right. And so we're able to talk about these things a little bit more and that's really the antidote, right? So the antidote to shame is connection, vulnerability, and communication around those difficulties. Connection, communic. What did you say? Connection, Sorry. communication, and I can't even remember what the third thing. Con- was. Connection, communication, and vulnerability. And vulnerability. Yeah. Good job. Cool. I'm glad somebody's listening to me. I'm listening. We're <laughs> no, all listening. I'm not listening. So. Those are the things though, like that's the crucial, you know, kind of thing that we have to do. And I'm seeing it all over my social media feeds, you know, like it's no longer just, I mean, I guess partially because nobody's recreating in the mountains these days, but it's not just like a feed of like accomplishments and badass views and awkwardness, right? It's suddenly like, oof, today was hard. What's up? Well, that, and and then it's like hashtag self-care. Like what does self-care look like? What does self-love look like? Like, (laughs) <laughs> I, I looked it up yeah yeah I was like what is self-love and you know like it, it means like it's self-care yeah so I think that's like a great point because I think that um so rice like rest ice compression elevation nice right so that's like okay so when you've had a really hard day what's your mental version of rice so maybe that's a glass of wine right Maybe that's watching Netflix. Maybe that's a chat with your partner or your friend or a pets with the dog or a walk, right? So what does that look like? And I think we fail to always like recuperate long enough, you know? So my partner has one of those watches that like tells you how long you're supposed to rest after your endeavor, you know? Like it's like, oh, you did. One of those partners. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, okay, you get 10 minutes of rest, you know, or whatever. But um like so what about that psychologically you know how does that relate so i love know. that though like that's that's a great like that helps put examples to this what is self care like yeah, yeah. and for Thank everybody you. it's different right mm-hmm. so for me it might be a bubble bath and other people are like i think baths are stupid well cool like that's why we all have our different five you know list of five and we we have those you know kind of ready to go um the same way you you know exactly what to do if you tweak your knee or if you you know feel sore you're like okay i gotta stretch i gotta whatever so you know how does that relate and i you know i feel like there are days i come home from work and i say to my partner like i don't want to talk tonight like i i don't want to have a conversation like my brain needs to just be like powered down and i'm just gonna stretch and maybe watch some tv and that's it And there are other nights where I come home and I'm like, I need to process my whole day. So even day to day, rice, you know, or self-care looks different. But um, knowing what your body needs, what your mind needs, like that's the task, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this stuff. Will you tell me something you're really proud of in the last, uh, I don't know, something that really brings they're proud of? Um, Professionally or personally? What's the first thing that came to your mind? Um, that's I'm proud of being a successful business owner these days. That's what I'm doing right now, is that I'm doing this thing, I'm making a difference, and I'm able to do a mortgage. Those are all pretty things. Things that we need to expect, you know. Um, I couldn't quite hear you. It's a little muffled on my side, but I can you hear me? Sweet. Um, but I am so grateful and proud of what you have created and the work that you're doing and a willingness to be 
vulnerable and out there. And where can people find you? You your website alone has so many resources, and it's not just for super wealthy. Like there's so many ways that you can that you are offering help. So where can people find you? Yeah. I'm on Instagram, Secret Psychological, and I try to have my Instagram be like free therapy. So I'm just putting ideas out there and writing up little stories and anecdotes that hopefully people can learn from. Um, we're going to be launching like a series of online kind of mental fitness training plans. And um, communities, I saw. Yeah, yeah. So we have like a lot that we um, do that is just beyond therapy. So if therapy isn't right for you, like that doesn't mean you can't get mentally well. Just the same way that I don't like to go to Zumba classes, but that I do. It's not for everybody, um, and no, nothing is Zumba. I think it's really great for people. Just awesome. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you so much. Have an awesome weekend in the mountains and yeah. um, everybody who tuned in and uh, is showing up every day and being the best versions of ourselves we can. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. Bye, friends. <laughs>